Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode 136. I'm your host, Derek Moore. This week, let's talk a little about political risk. More specifically, uh, you probably heard in the news, the continuing, continuing resolution. Then we had the, uh, the debt ceiling, the infrastructure bill, and the budget. So a couple things here, and why am I going to talk about this? Well, it's been in the news, and it does see, you know, sometimes this stuff matters, sometimes it doesn't. And I think more recently, the markets have reacted to, to some of this stuff. There's some nuances in it, and so I'll, I'll go over those. But it also relates back to the economy, relates back to inflation, relates back to corporate profits. And so that's why I wanted to discuss this. There's really four things that are going on right now. Number one is uh, the continuing resolution. Uh, that's basically where on October 1st, if they didn't do something, the federal government would shut down. And so th this gets a little bit wonky. I, I don't want to get wonky on you, right? Let's not do that. But every year they're supposed to pass a budget, okay? If they don't pass a budget and you come to the end of the fiscal year, which is the end of September, um, I believe it's the end of September, then you have to either shut down the government or you pass, you don't pass a budget, you pass a continuing re resolution to sort of keep operating under the old budget. And really none of this matters, right? Because they just overspend anyway. It's not like we've balanced the budget in the US anytime, <laughs> anytime recently. So, but that that's one of the things. And then we have the debt ceiling. There's a rule in place that debt held by the public, I believe the ceiling right now is 28, uh, I was gonna say billion, no, that's not even close, 28 trillion. And then there's there's two other things. There's the infrastructure package, and then there's the the budget, the actual budget, and that one, I know everyone refers to it as the $3.2 trillion bill, but uh, that is a budget resolution. In other words, that, that would be them passing the budget and they you know, throw whatever they want in there. And there's something called reconciliation. So let's kind of start there. There are two different ways to pass. One is you pass the, the normal process. The other is you do this thing called budget rec reconciliation. So let's just look at the Senate. So in the Senate, you can pass a bill with 51 votes, or if it's 50-50, like it is now, Democrats, Republicans, or Republicans, Democrats, depending upon how, what, how you want to say it, then the vice president can come in. Uh, in this case, it's uh, Vice President Harris. She can come in and she can break a 50-50 tie. So essentially, the Democrats right now have a 51 to 50. They, uh, that is their, their margin. Now, a bill can pass with just 51 votes, but the opposing uh, side, it doesn't necessarily have to be all one party, but any senator could get up and filibuster, meaning they can talk and talk and talk and never allow it to really get to a vote. And so in order to pass something to be filibuster proof, meaning you need enough votes that nobody can just get up there and talk, remember the one year, who is it? Uh, oh, I can't remember his name. Senator from, from Texas, he got up and read green eggs and ham in the Senate chamber. So, but if you get 60 votes, then you can pass it and you can override the, the filibuster. So typically there's a, there's a once a year, and I'll put a link to this. This is the uh, uh, House Committee on the Budget. And uh, there's actually a PDF you can download, but I'll, I'll put a link to this. And there's this other way of passing something. It's called reconciliation. And so reconciliation typically is that's going to happen when there's a situation where you're, you're passing a budget. And there, there are some rules to it, and I'll kind of get to those. But reconciliation, uh, according, and I'm, I'm referencing this House Committee on the Budget, uh, it's a tool, a special process, makes it easier to pass legislation. If you do it through reconciliation, you can do it with simple majority, and it can't be stalled in the Senate by a filibuster. So, and technically, uh, well, let me, not, let me not confuse things. 
So instead of 60 votes, you can do it with just a simple majority. In this case, it would be 51, including the vice president. So I, actually, it could be 50 if one of the other senators does not vote. And that happens sometimes. So leave it to politicians. Sometimes they don't want to put their name on something. And they vote present or they just don't vote anyway. So why do they use it? Um, so only policies that change spending or revenues can be included. And there's a little bit of debate time. There's only certain kinds of amendments that can be offered. So when you have a bill, like let's say a, a bill was in the Senate and it was a budget bill. And I said, uh, I want to put an amendment in that we also include that everyone in the U.S. will receive a New York Yankees jersey in the mail and we'll pay for it. So it's, that's an amendment, right? It's a silly amendment. Well, maybe not. Everyone should have a New York Yankees jersey. Anyway, so that, uh, it's a little bit more limited what type of amendments. I mean, a lot of these bills, amendments get stuck in there and basically, you know, that's how you get the, the bridge to nowhere and stuff like that. So it's, it's supposed to be for consideration of bills to implement the policy choices uh, on the annual congressional budget resolution, all right? So every year, budget resolution, Congress sets the total spending, the revenues, the uh, surplus deficit, and the public debt. And the budget can also include instructions. The instructions direct one or more committees to recommend changes, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So you kind of get the idea, right? And there are some, there are some rules. One of them is the Byrd rule and it's named after Senator Byrd. And basically it's from the eighties. Again, I'm ha referencing the house committee on the budget site. Started in the eighties to limit extraneous provisions. Imagine politicians would do that from inclusion and reconciliation bills. And the Byrd rule, it basically, it prevents the, the reconciliation process from, you know, to move uh, legislative items that are unrelated to spending or taxes, okay? And so you can't put in there provisions that, you know, you, you couldn't put in there necessarily something that doesn't relate, it's not supposed to relate to, to you know, for example, I think the, and the Senate has a parliamentarian and the parliamentarian has to actually approve it. And if they don't, you can't put it in there. So I think most recently there was, uh, uh, oh, but here's one. For example, minimum wage. I think it was last year. Uh, Democrats tried to put in minimum wage and the parliamentarian said, no, that's not, that's not a normal budgetary thing. So that would have to be done with normal legislation. So anyway, so the Byrd rule prohibits inclusion of extraneous measures. Um, and it's and those measures are things with no budgetary effect, no change in outlays or revenues, uh, measures that worsen the deficit when a committee has not achieved its reconciliation target, whatever that means. I kind of know what it means, but let's, let's move on. Uh, and then measures outside jurisdiction. All right, these are all boring, right? You get the idea. So you can't stuff a bunch of, not supposed to be able to stuff a bunch of stuff in there, okay? So they can uh, do that once a year and they're going to do it on this, uh, uh, their aim is to do it as part of the, the budget, the 3.2 trillion, I think is what's proposed. And there'll be some back and forth. The parliamentarian will, will take out or put stuff in and that's it. So if they pass it, it passes. And, you know, that's it. One thing to, to mention is, you know, a lot of times people put these numbers on thing and they say, you know, it won't raise the deficit or won't do such and such, uh, will, or will reduce the deficit. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office or CBO, they score a lot of these bills. And the, the challenge with this is I think they, they're only limited to the inputs they receive. And I think they can put some footnotes but in other words, if, if you want to get to the result that you want, you know, it kind of depends what you give them. And then I don't think they're allowed to, to bring in other things. So, for example, not, not only just, you know, they got to work with the numbers they are, but unintended consequences or saying, hey, you know, we'll, we'll raise this tax or we'll do this. And they can't consider 
potential other things that would happen. Um, so anyway, so basically you, you have that. All right, so let, let's get back to the, how does this relate to, to everything? I wanted to go through that. All right, so I mentioned the, the government was going to shut down if they didn't pass a budget by the end of September. Well, the second thing, that, the other thing they can do is the continuing resolution. So they did that. They, uh, they averted a shutdown. They sent a nine-week funding patch to the president. And uh, once, uh, once the president signs that, then essentially you're, you continue the old budget with, with a few little things thrown in. And so nine weeks, that kind of puts you, what does that put us at? Kind of in, in December. So if they don't pass a budget by December, they'll have to do this again, okay? But that actually passed. Uh, they wanted to avert a government shutdown. It isn't one thing on on the government shutdown. I read a piece. Uh, if I find it, I'll put it in the show notes. But they quoted, I think it was the the CBO again, uh, Congressional Budget Office. It might have been somebody else who estimated during the last government shutdown that was in 2018. I think that was 35 days. They estimate that the government shutdown uh, cost GDP or reduced GDP, gross domestic product, by about 0.1% uh, to 0.3%, if I'm remembering it right. Uh, what is interesting, of course, is that uh, the stark contrast to that is, you know, you shut down the government, the federal government anyway, a um, little bit of a hit to GDP, but remember when they shut down the uh, the whole economy in Q2 of 20, that was a negative 30% annualized hit to uh, GDP. We'll have to discuss that a little bit more. But anyway, uh, obviously, it's not good for the people who it affects. And it could affect, you know, some, some payments and things like that. But uh, so that has been passed for now. So next thing is the debt ceiling. And uh, actually, no, let, let's go to infrastructure. So the other thing was the Senate actually passed an infrastructure bill. And now what has happened, and it was a bipartisan bill. Well, so what, what happened with that? So the Senate passes it, and now it goes to the House. And the House has not yet brought it to the floor. And typically, House leaders or Senate leaders, a lot of times they won't just, unless they, they want it for political reasons, have everybody go on the record, but a lot of times they'll go and they'll they'll uh, round up their their members and try and get an idea of what they um, what they're going to vote. And if they know it's not going to pass, it's sort of embarrassing to them to to bring it up only to fail. Unless unless they want to put people on the record. And sometimes there's a little game theory. People say they'll vote against something. They'll vote for it until the very last second. So that has been pulled. Uh, they were going to vote on it Friday, and that was pulled. And so at this point, uh, let's see, I, I think Speaker Pelosi has said, because uh, the Democrats hold uh, the Congress, that they want to have a vote between, uh, what does this say? Maybe by the end of October or something like that. So Yeah, it looks like it looks like that's and one of the one of the things too. A lot of her caucus is saying that uh, what's happening there is a lot of the uh, House Democrats are saying I'm not going to vote for this uh, this infrastructure bill unless we also vote for the the 3.2 trillion dollar budget bill. Okay, so that's infrastructure, and then debt ceiling is um, the debt ceiling was put in place a long time ago. And uh, I'll try and find something that I can, I can put in. As far as I know, and I, I looked this up, it was raised 74 times uh, between 1962 to 2011. And then it's been... So pretty much what happens is, obviously, we don't balance... Congress doesn't balance the budget. They spend more than they take in. Of course, if anybody, if any business did that or any individual, that w wouldn't be good. But uh, obviously, they're very good at spending other people's money. So they, uh, and I'm just looking at the the history. Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes they suspend it by legislation. Other times they just raise it. 
And so to give you some perspective, in 1997, it was 5.9 trillion. So that was the debt limit. It's like, hey, we can't, we can't spend more, we can't pass things, uh, or we can't spend any more money if we get up to the debt limit and we exceed it. And they just, you know, kind of just automatically suspend it. So the debt limit ended at the end of July. And it looks like it was about 28 trillion, 28.5 trillion or so. And so that is, it's supposed to limit spending, right? And, you know, basically, and it was created in 1917. And it was supposed to, you know, kind of the ceiling, debt ceiling, it's a limitation on the federal government's ability to manage the economy and finance system. Uh, it's also a limitation. I'm reading from uh, uh, Wikipedia and a limitation of the federal government's ability to finance government operations. So anyway, you know, and some of this is if they're just going to have a, if they're just going to keep raising it, why do it? Well, politically what happens is, so if this isn't put into the infrastructure bill where you can pass it, um, you know, through reconciliation. And, and I'm actually not sure if a parliamentarian would let them put in the uh, the debt ceiling bill to that. I, I don't know for sure, though. But typically what happens is the party that's not in power, I mean, doesn't have the majority, you know, the presidency, they can extract things from the other party in a, you know, to form an agreement where they say, okay, well, we can we can hold up this debt limit, debt ceiling, vote because we can filibuster, and if we filibuster, you're not going to be able to pass it. And so, quite often, what happens is the party not in power, the minority party, they'll they'll say, okay, do this, this, and this, or do this, and, and we'll kind of go along. There's recently it's become a little more contentious, and they've taken it further and further towards, you know, the actual day. Now, although the debt ceiling, uh, you know, is the end of July, right? It's, uh, we're not at 28 trillion or 28 and a half trillion. Secretary Yellen, uh, Treasury Sec- Secretary, she's estimated middle of October. Other people estimate it might be a little bit later because you can change some of the, the priorities. Uh, but they they can't necessarily right now issue new debt. So if if you get up to this, you cannot exceed the debt limit. And so uh, the danger there is if we actually were to ever default on our debt, our credit rating would go down, interest rates would go up, and just would probably not be great for the markets, right? So my thought on this is that uh, typically they've – They've worked it out in some fashion uh, before, you know, they've never let us default. And so there's a lot of political wrangling on that. Uh, So I would expect that you'll continue to see politicians do what politicians do best, which is talk, make promises that they may or may not keep. And, uh, you know, each side will have their own version of of kind of what's going to happen. So why do I, and then, okay, finally, the, the budget bill. So I think it was 3.2 trillion, and now it seems like that's going to be pared back a little bit. And who knows whether they meant they really wanted 3.2 trillion, or figured they'd start there, knowing it would get pared back. So that's the other thing that has to yet to be determined exactly what the final number will be. But the reason why all of this matters is that we're seeing some uh, what the Fed is calling transitory or longer transitory or maybe transitory used to mean just a little while and now it means up to six months. But we are seeing some uh, some inflation and we're also seeing, you know, some of the supply chain issues. Uh, I've talked about the shipping container issues. We've got more boats or uh, container ships anchored off the coast of the port of Los Angeles, and I think Long Beach, than, uh, than ever. Uh, you have the cost to ship a container. It used to be 1000 to 1500 back in uh, uh, you know 2019, and now it's 
11,000, 13,000 a container. So you've seen a lot of, um, and I bring this up because depending upon what's in that bill or the infrastructure bill, if it is a supply side issue, as opposed to a demand side issue, meaning, meaning that if you throw money into it, if it's a demand side issue, then the idea is that you stimulate demand. But if it's a supply side issue that's causing inflation and problems, and it seems like it's uh, you could make the case that that is the issue here, then throwing money at, at something uh, would be sort of doing the wrong thing. It would exacerbate inflation further. So all of these bills, either passing, not passing, uh, being increased in the dollar amounts, coming down, all of those things matter because as expectations of these things, uh, you know, the expectations in the interest rate market and the, and the equity market, sometimes good news is uh, bad news is good news and vice versa. And so if, uh, if some of these get paired back, the market may take that as, oh, hey, that's, that's less inflationary or, you know, those things. So, and so I, I think that's, that's really the thing I wanted to convey here today is I've gotten some questions about these. I wanted to go through some of the terms that you're hearing. And I would watch, you know, mid-October is what the Treasury Secretary, other people say different, but that's the number that, that she's given. I think mid-October, uh, October 13th or 18th is when we would breach the debt ceiling and in theory, uh, you know, not be able to, to, to pay our debts. Again, other people dispute that and say the government could take other measures. I think they're already taking measures, uh, but certainly that's uh, that's coming up. And then, you know, just kind of take, be listening for all these votes and we'll see what happens. Um, in the end though, you know, the nice part of this, although we're, we're interested in markets and I know people listen to this are very interested in markets and talk about it all the time and, and sort of uh, hypothesize of, of what will happen in markets. You know, in the end, if you've got a, a strategy that has good hedges in it, all this stuff is just noise and you know, as long as you have protection in the portfolio, you don't have to try and time this stuff. And so I wanted to point that out as well. So, um, all right. So next week we will probably have another guest on. You'll find out who the guest is next week. And uh, I appreciate the, the people who reach out. Uh, I'll put my email. Uh, of course, it's uh, Derek, D-E-R-E-K dot Moore, M-O-O-R-E at Zega, Z as in Zebra, E-G-A financial dot com. And uh, I'd love to hear from listeners. Let me know if you have any show ideas. Uh, this one was actually from a, a listener who said, you know, you, I really haven't done anything explaining all this stuff that I hear in the news. So those, uh, those came for it, uh, came, came from a, a listener. And instead of rating and starring, reviewing, go ahead and share this podcast with someone you might know. Um, even someone you don't know, just you know, walk up to them and say, hey, let me, let me borrow your phone. I'll put this podcast on your phone. So do that and continue to uh, send emails. I like emails. I like talking to uh, listeners. All right, everyone. That's it for this week. We'll be back for episode number 137 next week. Have a good week, everyone.